Hey guys, what's up? Sandu here. So today I'll be testing an all-in-one DAC preamp and headphone amp combo that really despises those off-the-shelf op-amps and instead uses only discrete uh, op-amps, also a fully class A output stage for a highly engaging, vivid and natural sound performance. Of course, I'm about the bar sound conductor free performance, which I'll be simply calling free XP from now on. But uh, wait a minute, didn't I already review a uh, bar sound conductor free around here? Uh, yes, that is actually correct, but that was a uh, conductor free reference, so a much bigger unit than this one, also much more expensive. So this one is part of the performance series, which is obviously smaller. Uh, it uses uh, one duct chip instead of two and uh, three max current power supplies instead of five. Uh, the price also was slashed quite a lot, but I'm pretty sure that in terms of um, sound performance, uh, Barson didn't slash anything in this one. So let's check how it performs, but uh, let's talk first about the differences between the reference and the performance line. On the DAC side, instead of two ESS 9038Q2M DAC chips, the smaller one uses only a single DAC chip, but don't get upset, my friends, because as absolutely the best Delta Sigma DACs that I have ever tested around here, and mind you, I've tested quite a lot of them, we're using only a single chip. So more is certainly not better. The implementation is by leaps and bounds more important. The bigger unit has five max current power supplies instead of only three on the smaller one, which means that its display, DAC section, analog left and analog right are all separated on the reference unit for a lower channel crosstalk and impedance. The power output dropped slightly too, so from 7.5 watts in 16 ohms, it now sits at 6 watts on the balanced output. So not a huge difference if you ask me, and as my test will prove later on, the smaller device is more than capable of powering even the most demanding headphones. Another change is that the biggest reference unit has two XLR analog inputs, meaning that you can use that one as a dedicated headphone amp or as a preamp, basically bypassing its internal DAC section. The smaller unit doesn't have such inputs, but it can still work as a dedicated DAC, as a DAC plus preamp, or as a DAC plus headphone amp combo, so it's really up to you. The most amazing part is that both units are sharing basically the same DNA, they have the same cool case, which is by about 300% more efficient at heat dissipation. They both use the newest generation discrete op-amps, as V6 Classic and V6 Vivid. They use the same max current power supplies, so the same Bluetooth chipset, and most importantly, the same DAC chip and the same fully discrete Class A output stage. But how about the price? From 2200 bucks of the reference unit, it nose dived to a much more affordable 1400 bucks, and that is a really, really good thing. In terms of design, conductor free reference and performance units are the first ones that in almost 10 years received updated looks with redesigned cases from the ground up. On the inside, every single internal square inch was used at maximum potential, so that is some clever engineering if you ask me. With this case, Borson doubled the surface area of the newest generation of conductors that are way more effective at dissipating heat. As for controls, on its front plate you'll find a 4-pin XLR headphone jack a single-headed quarter-inch headphone jack, a 3.5mm microphone input, and on the left is your power on-off button and on the right is your menu button. A monochrome OLED screen is located exactly in the middle for my OCD friends. It will show all the important stuff as the volume position, the selected digital input, analog output, and the sample rates. The volume wheel works in digital domain and has 99 steps, so no more guessing how much power is there left on top. On its back you can spot three digital inputs, so a USB Type-C, optical and coaxial, plus a Bluetooth socket uh, with an antenna on the right. Since it can work as a dedicated DAC, but also as a DAC plus preamp unit, you can also find two pairs of analog outputs, so a standard RCA output that can be volume controlled or fixed, and a fixed XLR output. Ok guys, I'm ready for some music, so let's hit some eardrums. As for the sound performance, I can summarize the sound signature of this unit by just using few words. Uh, at first it felt simply 
very powerful with my headphones. It had this visceral and really bottomless type of bass. It had a really a smooth and a warm mid-range, but it was not overdone at all. Uh, it had a really extended type of treble, so really snappy sounding, really textured treble. Plus also an iron grip over the headphone drivers and also over the speaker drivers. Uh, it also had a faster pace and also an engaging type of sound. Uh, it made me tap my feet and also move my head. And from a plethora of all-in-one devices that I have tried in the past, but I have tried a lot of them, only three of them had the same uh, engaging and fast-paced type of sound. The sound stage size was also something different, so quite special, so to speak. Uh, it was simply expanded in all directions. It simply unlocked a 3D image in front of me where I could simply pick those sounds pretty easily. Um, it actually reminded me quite a lot about its bigger brother, so about the Barson performance, uh, Barson free reference, uh, sorry, and also about the Flux Lab Acoustics FCN10 and about that fully upgraded Audio GD D28. It so happens that only these three devices are all working in class A. They all ditched uh, those um, off the shelf op amps and they all are using only discrete uh, components as bipolar transistors or GFETs and so on. And um, after living for a longer period of time with a linear sounding uh, setup like my own Matrix Audio Element X that feeds an achromatic sounding uh, benchmark HPA4, I almost forgot how fun can be uh, headphone listening. I have a feeling that uh, this small conductor is somehow possessed by a small beast that sits inside and whips my music and makes everything just more snappy, more engaging, uh, faster sounding. Uh, or the tones are much richer. Uh, everything is just bolder, meatier, bolder sounding somehow. So it's a type of sound that you want to just listen for a longer period of time and you don't want to analyze your music, uh, every corner of your music. So it's uh, very much against being uh, linear sounding or boring sounding or ultra smooth sounding. It doesn't tilt towards brightness or thinness as well. Uh, you will not find anything like, like that in here. In terms of background noise, uh, since I was still doing that uh, Kitches S125 power amplifier review, I thought that I should test the noise floor of this one in a speaker setup first. So the next minute I connected this one to the S125 and this one worked as a DAC plus preamp combo. And I was driving those uh, Bucard S400 loudspeakers. And the absolute first thing that, uh, that hit me is that even at this affordable price point, it absolutely obliterated the performance of my own 3000 uh, Matrix Audio Element X that was working as a DAC plus uh, preamp unit. I simply felt a much better grip over the speaker drivers uh, with this one. Uh, it felt simply more visceral sounding, uh, more engaging sounding, uh, more lifelike in a way. So I'm pretty sure that its line amplifier is better than that of the Element X. And in a speaker setup, I'm yet to hear a better unit like that reference unit or this performance unit or that Gustard A22. They simply shined in a stereo setup and uh, I'm pretty sure that the line amplifiers are saying uh, the last words in here. So when it comes to noise, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, those DC servo circuits inside the S125 was already killing plenty of source noise with the help of negative feedback. And the final result was of course a crystal clear sound without any kinds of artifacts. So it was simply noiseless with a really dark background. Moving on the little person to a headphone setup, I've used the most sensitive IMs that I have at my disposal. So the Fio FI9 in their high sensitivity mode and those uh, Mesa Ripenta are very easy to drive and they are not shy at all at showing uh, the source noise of your setup. So I used them only on the single-ended headphone output and the uh, maximum I could go was about 30 out of 99 on the high gain and about 65 out of 99 on the low gain. And uh, no matter the volume position and no matter the selected gain, there was a very faint, barely audible hum. Uh, but I can spot that only by using uh, memory foam ear tips and also by having a complete silence in my room. Otherwise, I cannot spot it anymore. I need to mention that it's there, but in very, very small doses. 
and I feel that the Burson tuned this one to work much better with IMs this time around. But the good part is that no matter the selected gain, no matter the volume position, how much you go up and down, uh, the hum stays completely on the same level, so it doesn't rise at all. And all the rest of the Class A combos that I tried in the past, like uh, Flux Lab Acoustics FC10 of that or that Audio GD D28, were simply increasing the noise floor when I was increasing the volume. As for resolution and transparency, if we are talking about a top of the line ESS Sabre design with a fully discrete Class A output stage as this one is having, then we are talking about a badass transparency and a really good detail retrieval. And uh, when I connected these uh, two headphones, so Odyssey LCD4 and uh, Hi-Fi Man Area, I simply felt that uh, briefing type of sound, really transparent type of sound, where I could focus anything, any way I wanted. So um, it so happens that these headphones are extracting quite a lot more information compared to my loudspeakers. So of course this test was mostly made with headphones. And all in all, overall, uh, I felt a very high level of resolution with this one. It's easily approaching high-end DAC territory and uh, it is still not on the same level with the best units that I've tried up to this point, but it's really, really close and uh, I could easily live with such a device when it comes to transparency and details. Transit response is uh, quite special, it's like asking a boxer if he knows how to land a punch and I certainly felt the same with the little Borson and all other devices that are working in Class A that I tried before, all those combos uh, were absolutely amazing in terms of uh, slam impact, uh, basically transit response. I'm yet to hear a better slam and impact to that of the Flux Lab Acoustics FC10. And Borson Conductor Free Reference that I've tested one year ago was also very impressive. And this one uh, simply follows the footsteps of its bigger brother. Uh, it's exactly the same, so it has the same DNA. So it's uh, simply a natural pugilist uh, with that hairy chest, uh, with uh, punching hard and mean and going really fast when a truck is asking for it. I want to outline that with a powerful output stage that consists only of discrete circuitry that provides a constant class A power for those headphones. You don't really need some uh, angry tunes, you don't need some metal music, you don't need some electronic tracks to unleash some of the punchiest notes, some of that uh, fast pace impact. You simply need a device that knows how to accelerate and decelerate your music. In the slam department, it actually outperformed my own benchmark HPA4 and its bigger brother did absolutely the same. So it literally changed some headphones to unrecognizable, uh, like the Hi-Fi Man area, for example. So I find them engaging only with very few amplifiers and this is one of the nicest pairings uh, with it. As for the soundstage and depth, as I had said in my preliminary impressions, it simply draws a much bigger picture in front of me and it will place all those sounds around me. Uh, it's like uh, picking cherries from a tree, so very easy to do, uh, to focus on any sounds I want. And when you have such a detailed and transparent type of sound plus an energetic type of sound, uh, pushing simply bigger quantities of air, it's absolutely normal to experience a, a deeper and a much wider soundstage and without staying anything in front of you, so basically that is uh, how it sounds. I personally never understood headphones like Hyperman Aria uh, being driven by solid state electronics uh, because they had a pretty weird soundstage, so it was uh, pretty tall but not uh, wide sounding, so to speak. Uh, with tube-based amplifiers, uh, these were transforming into something else. They were sounding like a normal pair of open back headphones. So much bigger sounding, much airier sounding. It was quite a surprise for me because on both Burson design, so performance line and reference line, uh, hi Man area was simply coming back to their senses and they are sounding uh, more like my open back headphones, so much bigger sounding. Uh, I simply took somehow few steps back and uh, 
I can now see a much bigger picture in front of me and I see the play that is happening before my eyes. So instead of looking at a smaller, uh, medium-sized screen, it's like I'm looking at a much bigger picture now, at a cinema screen with more things on my right, more things on my left, uh, below me and above my head. As for the frequency response, you should know that the unit I'm testing today uses four uh, V6 Vivid op amps. And if you want a slightly a different sound, you can mix and match with uh, those classic op amps. So you can use uh, two Vivids and two classic if you want a different sound. And Borson is also offering a bare bones version with those nasty sounding GRCA op amps. But I'm strongly advising getting that version. Bass is simply oozing bad attitude out of this one. So it hits pretty fast, it slumps like a hammer too. But it's also a clean type of bass that is also layered and brief, so it's also super controlled. So I'm going to say that the bass performance is a little bit elevated in this one. Uh, especially the mid bass uh, is adding quite a lot of warmth and a little bit of bad attitude in this one. Mid range, it's quite different compared to the rest of the ESS Sabre designs that I tried up to this point. Uh, it's uh, a little bit smoother and warmer, but I wouldn't say that it's really warm and smooth or anything like that. So there is, uh, however, quite a lot of naturalness in this one. And I'm pretty sure that class A uh, is leaving a big stain in here. Plus that all discrete circuitry also is adding a lot of magic in here. So mid-range is simply rendered really clear. It has the right amount of uh, naturalness. I never spotted dry or thin mid-range in this one. It will always infuse just a little bit of its own medicine, improving the mid-range presence and make it more real. Treble is standing out completely in this one and it even jumps before those bass lines. So there is a lot of information in the treble region. But if you'd like to have uh, less treble presence, simply swap two Vivid op amps with two classic op amps and uh, the problem is simply solved. I think that the treble is not bright at all, so nothing like that. It's, uh, I can spot that nasty ringing in the mid or upper treble. It's simply very defined and uh, just a little bit sharp sounding. For the record, the rest of the Class A gang that I've tried before, like the Flag Slab Acoustics FCM10 and Audio GD D28, they felt less extended in the treble and had quite uh, a lot of uh, roll off in the treble that uh, Borson is not having. I also compared the sound performance of this one to the Flux Lab Acoustics FC10 that costs almost the same with this one. But since I don't want to make this video super long or boring, please check out that detailed comparison somewhere around here. It's on chapter 8 and it's one click away. As for the conclusion, I really wish I had moments like this with every single audio component that I'm testing around here. It simply unlocked so many positive vibes and so much raw energy came out of those speakers and out of these headphones. When I'm waking up in the morning and I need just a little bit of kickstart to start my day, I know exactly what needs to be done. I need to push the small aluminum button on the left, press play, lean back and let the dopamine do its thing. It's really that easy. So it costs 1400 bucks, so definitely not a very cheap unit, but it performed above my expectations, so um, I'm happy to recommend it as a great sounding all-in-one unit. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed my review. My full in-depth review is waiting on my website. In case you want to support this channel, please subscribe to it and thank you for doing that. And as usual, listen to my music, be positive, and I'll see you soon. Cheers guys! Bye bye!